The Black Side of Georgia Justice When it came to justice in Georgia, blacks experienced an outcome markedly different from that which Jews enjoyed. As with other states with high populations of blacks, Georgia's legal system remained critical to the state's white supremacist infrastructure, and it wholly devoted its resources to crippling the black man and woman and forcing them, through fear, intimidation, and unprovoked brutality, into economic and political subservience. Candidates in the 1906 gubernatorial race publicly jousted for votes over, quote, the most effective way to keep blacks away from the ballot box, end quote. The overarching policy imperative was to keep the state's quarter million black farm workers and their families tethered to the plantation, providing the labor for an economy still almost totally based on cotton. All of Georgia's laws upheld and reinforced that racist economic policy objective. Blacks could be arrested without cause put on chain gangs, and held for any length of time. The concept of legal representation by an attorney, or even due process, was as remote for blacks as was voting or equal pay. The hardened custom of barring, quote, Negro testimony, end quote, placed all blacks in a legal no-man's land, where a crime against them was entirely invisible unless and until a white man, for his own purposes and self-interest, chose to corroborate that testimony. There were fewer than 10 black lawyers practicing in the entire state of Georgia at the time of the Leo Frank trial, down from twice that number just a few years before. As far as blacks were concerned, the Atlanta police force was little more than a legitimized den of hoodless Klansmen. The black-owned newspaper, Weekly Defiance in 1881, quote, We have lived in Atlanta 27 years, and we have heard the lash sounding from the cabins of the slaves, poured on by their masters. But we have never seen a meaner set of low-down cutthroats, scrapes and murderers, than the city of Atlanta has to protect the peace, end quote. In 1905, Atlanta police arrested roughly 10,000 black men, an astounding 20% of the black male population, but not for any actual crimes. Though the generalized charge of, quote, vagrancy, end quote, black criminals underwent corrections through the therapy of forced labor. Black men were leased to planters in times of harvest and to construction firms to build the state's roads and bridges. Nine out of ten people arrested in Georgia for these invented offenses were black, branding much of the male population as criminal, a fact that would frame much of the pro-Frank rhetoric at trial and in the media then and since. Professor Leonard Dinnerstein confirmed that Atlanta's police force, quote, rely increasingly on an irrational use of power. On one occasion, for example, when Atlanta had experienced a labor shortage, the police attempted to rectify the condition by arresting all able-bodied men found on one of the main streets. Employed and unemployed, black and white, were hauled into court, fined, and sentenced to the stockade without being given a chance to defend themselves. End quote. Throughout the Leo Frank case, blacks were suffering horrific public violence. This is just a sample. Quote, Atlanta Constitution, August 7, 1915. Negroes were hanged as spectators sang. There is land of pure delight. Seven men legally executed and two lynched. Jackson, Mississippi, August 6. Three Negroes were hanged today in Mississippi for murder. At Starkville, a crowd estimated to number several thousand persons witnessed the public execution of Peter Bolin and Jim Seals, convicted of killing another Negro. Bunyan Walter was hanged at Fayetteville for the murder of Tom Seals. At the request of the doomed Negroes, the crowd at Starkville, in which there were many Negroes, sang the hymn, There is a land of pure delight, just before the trap was sprung. The gallows was built in a natural amphitheater in a large pasture encircled by hills which afforded the spectators an unobstructed view of the hangings. 
Soft drink and candy vendors sold their wares among the crowd while it waited for the execution of the sentences. Four men hanged in Alabama. Montgomery, Alabama, August 6th. Four persons were legally executed in Alabama today. Governor Henderson refusing to grant reprieves in all cases. At Evergreen, Robert Watkins and John Salter, Negroes, were hanged while a squad of militiamen stood guard. The Negroes murdered Mrs. Mary Lassiter, a white woman, left Wiley House, a planter, for dead and burned the farmhouse. At Coleman, George James, white, was hanged for the murder in Decatur of George Claiborne. James shot Claiborne through an open window while the latter was reading his Bible at night. Millard Carpenter, a Negro, was hanged at Birmingham for the murder two years ago of John T. Camp, a transfer man. Two Negroes lynched for attacking girls. Trilby, Florida, August 6th. Will Leach, a Negro, alleged to have attempted criminal assault on the person of a 13-year-old white girl at this place on June 30th, was taken from the county jailer and brought here and lynched. He was swung to an oak tree in front of the railway station, after which his body was riddled with bullets. Shawnee, Oklahoma, August 6th. Ed Berry, Negro, charged with two cases of criminal assault and suspected in connection with ten others in the last three years, was taken from officers early today and hanged to a telephone pole at the scene of one of his alleged crimes. Barry was secretly brought here for trial from the penitentiary at McMeester. When the deputy sheriff and his prisoner alighted, they were covered by a dozen masked men. The officer was disarmed. Ten or twelve automobiles loaded with masked men then appeared and the Negro was quickly conveyed to the Beard Street Bridge. When the rope was adjusted around Barry's neck, he was questioned about the crimes and asked if guilty. In each instance, he nodded his head affirmatively. In every case, the Negro's victim was a white woman. After the confession, the Negro was hanged in the presence of about 75 men, all masked. After daylight, the body was cut down and removed to an undertaking establishment. An inquest will be held. Since July 11th, Barry had been carried from one place to another and finally lodged in the penitentiary at McMeester for safekeeping. Barry's case was to have been heard here August 9th. Atlanta Constitution, August 2nd, 1915. Would-be lynchers balked by sheriff. Two Negroes are rushed at midnight from Fitzgerald to Macon. Macon, Georgia, August 1st. Two Negroes were rushed to this city at midnight from Fitzpatrick in Twiggs County to prevent a threatened lynching there. One of the Negroes, Ernest Chapel, is said to have confessed that he attempted to assault a white woman. The other, Will Thomas, is accused of stealing a cow. Both were in jail at Fitzpatrick when the sheriff learned that a mob was organizing to lynch the one accused of attempted assault, and he then brought them here for safekeeping. Atlanta Constitution, August 18, 1915. Woman's assailant lynched in Decatur. After being identified by victim, Negro is shot to death by mob at Amsterdam. Bainbridge, Georgia, August 17. Special. Searching parties early tonight captured a Negro who yesterday criminally assaulted a white woman at Amsterdam and, after carrying him before his victim, who identified him, quickly killed him with about 100 shots. The Negro's name is John Riggins. He was about 23 years old and had been in the community only a few days. Riggins made no attempt to escape, but returned to his work this morning in the tobacco packing house. When some of the searching party approached him and inquired if he knew a certain Negro from Quincy, Riggins became nervous and soon left work. He was caught before he had gone 200 feet and carried before the victim for identification. She promptly identified him after she had saved the lives of others earlier in the day through failure to accuse them. Feeling again normal. The rest of the program was quickly enacted and feeling in the section has returned to its normal state. 
Decatur has been a county for nearly 100 years, but so far as is known, the first criminal assault in its history occurred yesterday afternoon when an unknown Negro attacked the wife of a prominent tobacco man in the lower section of the county. The woman started out from her home near Amsterdam to the tobacco packing house where her husband was working. While passing through a thickly wooded section, the Negro sprang into the buggy and wrested from her hands the pistol with which she attempted to defend herself. When she recovered consciousness, the Negro was gone and on the back of her head was a painful wound. Whether inflicted by the butt of the pistol or by her head striking the buggy tire, she did not know. She managed to reach the place where her husband was awaiting her and told the story. Posse was orderly. Sheriff's deputies went to the scene immediately and started a thorough search, but an all-night effort failed to locate the Negro. The sheriff of Gadsden County, Florida, just across the line, also had a posse on the lookout. And besides, there were hundreds of the citizens of that community in the woods searching for the fugitive. From information obtained at the sheriff's office, it seems that the crowd in pursuit was unusually orderly and that there was no evidence of drunkenness nor any tendency to molest innocent Negroes. The people of the lower section of the county constitute some of the most conservative and level-headed people in this part of the state. The Negro's victim has been intermittently unconscious during the day and is reported to have fainted several times. Although her health was none too good at the time, she was reported to be resting very well at a late hour this afternoon. End quote. Three other articles along the same lines include Atlanta Journal, May 15, 1915 Slick Negro Not Fined for Stockade Escape Atlanta Journal, February 14, 1915 Three men are shot by Negro from ambush. Worth County Farmer dead, two others fatally wounded. Atlanta Journal, January 23, 1915 Two men are held for killing of Negro. The power wielded by the police, however, was not, quote, irrational, end quote, as Dinnerstein suggests. The need for black labor was particularly great, and the police force served as an important arm of a specific labor conscription strategy of Atlanta's business and political leaders. With all this flurry of police activity on behalf of business interests, it's no wonder only one murder in 100 was ever punished in Georgia. And since 1911, 20 unsolved murders of black women in Atlanta further proved the police force's real function as labor recruiters and overseers, not as peace officers and crime fighters. Black Trial, White Trial Quote, we believe there should be consequences to bigots and bigotry. One way to combat bigots is to put a price on bigotry. I would hope that if this is, in fact, true, that his colleagues condemn him and distance themselves from him. End quote. Abraham Foxman, former National Director of the Anti-Defamation League. Quote, there must have been a nigger in the crime who knew about it before Newt or anyone else. I am afraid Newt knew. Yet, if he did, he is one of the most remarkable niggers I ever saw, and I wish I had his nerve. End quote. Closing argument by Leo Frank's attorney, Luther Rosser. There was a galactic difference between the extensive hearing Leo Frank obtained and the kind of justice routinely dispensed to black defendants. Leo Frank's trial was the most expensive. $10,000, about $1.3 million today, and longest trial, 30 days and a transcript of 1,080,060 words, in the history of the South. By the time the governor commuted his death sentence, Frank had filed appeals in a dozen courts, had the services of two of the largest private investigation firms in the country, and obtained the representation of more than a dozen lawyers including the governor himself. Compare that with this account by journalist Pierre Von Passen, who visited an Atlanta courtroom 10 years after the Leo Frank lynching. Quote, the judge, a shriveled up little man with blackened teeth stumps and a drooping mustache, wore a soiled linen jacket, 
and had unfastened his collar, for it was stifling hot in the courtroom. On the side stood the prisoners, closely packed together, all Negroes. They were waiting to be tried, or rather to be sentenced, and were called one by one to face the man on the bench. Joe Smith, called out a cop. The man answering to that name approached the magistrate. Nigger, what was you doing in that woman's room Saturday night? Judge, I wasn't in no woman's room. Thirty days. Next. Fred Hastings, called out another cop. Haven't I seen you here before, nigger? No, sir, judge, I never. Thirty days. Next. Elsie Gibson. Your name, Elsie? You scratched your landlady's face? Was you drunk, Elsie? No, sir, your honor, I wasn't drunk. Thirty days. Charles Newman. Nigger. You were caught with a knife in your hand, threatening an officer. Your honor, that wasn't no knife. You carried a deadly weapon. Thirty days on the chain gang. But your honor, I was peeling potatoes when the officer walked in. And it wasn't no knife. Don't talk back. Sixty days. Sixty days, your honor. What for? Shut up, nigger. Ninety days on the chain gang. The trouble with you is that you talk too much. Geez, Your Honor, it was the Victrola that was playing. I wasn't doing no talking. You talked yourself into a year on the chain gang, nigger. You use profane language in court. Take that blabbermouth away. Next. End quote. In just 200 words, five of them, nigger, and about five minutes, the four blacks were sentenced to a total of 455 days, their lives and the lives of their families unalterably redefined and irrevocably labeled, quote, criminal, end quote, in the very same way as was James Conley. In open court, Frank's attorney, Luther Rosser, spoke the common language of white superiority. Quote, Nobody knows better than these police how they lie. Take a Negro caught with stolen chickens. He always says he bought them from Aunt Lizzie Jones. It's gotten so now that Andy Calhoun sends them to the chain gang just the minute they say that. Tell me they haven't imagination? I had old Negro mammies tell me about Br'er Rabbit and Tar Babies long before I ever heard of Uncle Remus. End quote. This was the, quote, justice, end quote, faced daily in Atlanta by black men, women, and children, a system devoid of the flock of attorneys, private investigators, multiple appeals, cross-examinations, international letter campaigns, petition drives, and indignant editorials, let alone a stenographer or witnesses or even a swearing-in, that Leo Frank availed himself of but claimed he never received. Georgia Lynchings After Leo Frank NAACP Field Secretary James Weldon Johnson wrote just five months after Frank's lynching. Quote, Only a few weeks ago, Georgia published a declaration of superiority by lynching seven Negroes and burning down the meeting places of several colored lodges. Now comes the news of a mob in the same state hanging five Negroes. End quote. In Valdosta, Georgia, just three years after Frank's death, a pregnant black woman named Mary Turner was hanged from a tree, then soaked with gasoline and set afire. As she hung there, a white man ripped open her womb with a penknife. The infant fell out and wailed twice before the monsters stomped it to death. These are the forgotten lynch victims of Georgia for whom no books are written. Indeed, they are so forgotten that a 2015 report by the Equal Justice Initiative found an incredible 700 lynchings that had been previously unknown. Below are just some of the innocent black lynching victims of white America in the state of Georgia since the murder of Leo Frank. On December 20, 1915, Sam Bland and Willie Stewart were lynched in Dodge on the unsupported accusation of murder. On December 30, 1915, Grandison Goolsby, Mike Goolsby, 
Ulysses Goolsby, Hosh Jewell, Charles Holmes, James Burton, and Early Hightower, were lynched in Early on the unsupported accusation of murder. On January 20, 1916, John Seymour, Felix Lake, Frank Lake, Dewey Lake, and Major Lake were lynched in Lee on the unsupported accusation of murder accomplice. On February 12, 1916, Marvin Harris was lynched in Twiggs on the unsupported accusation of murder. On February 25, 1916, Jesse Harris was lynched in Bartow on the unsupported accusation of attempted theft. On August 18, 1916, Lewis was lynched in Lowndes on the unsupported accusation of attempted theft. On September 20, 1916, Elijah Sturgis was lynched in Randolph on the unsupported accusation of unknown offense. On September 20, 1916, Henry White was lynched in Walker on the unsupported accusation of miscegenation. On September 20, 1916, Pete Hudson was lynched in Randolph on the unsupported accusation of murder. On September 27, 1916, Moxie Schuler was lynched in Decatur on the unsupported accusation of attempted rape. On October 4, 1916, Mary Conley was lynched in Calhoun on the unsupported accusation of unknown. On March 1, 1917, Linton Clinton was lynched in Thomas on the unsupported accusation of scared white girl. On March 28, 1917, Joe Noling was lynched in Mitchell on the unsupported accusation of unknown offense. On September 18, 1917, Rufus Moncrief was lynched in Clark on the unsupported accusation of gambling dispute. On November 9, 1917, Jesse Stater was lynched in Brooks on the unsupported accusation of writing letters to white girl. On November 17, 1917, Mac Johnson and Collins Johnson were lynched in Mitchell on the unsupported accusation of argument. On December 15, 1917, Claxton Declay was lynched in Candler on the unsupported accusation of murder. In 1918, an unknown person was lynched in Gordon on the unsupported accusation of unknown. On February 17, 1918, Bud Cosby was lynched in Fayette on the unsupported accusation of kidnapping slash theft. On May 17, 1918, Will Head, Will Thompson, Hayes Turner, Chime Riley, Mary Turner, Eugene Rice, Simon Schumann, and three unidentified men were lynched in Brooks County, Valdosta, on the unsupported accusation of murder slash accomplice. On May 18, 1918, Tom Devert was lynched in unknown on the unsupported accusation of attempted rape. On May 22, 1918, Jim Cobb was lynched in Crisp on the unsupported accusation of murder. On May 22, 1918, Spencer Evans was lynched in Talia Farrow on the unsupported accusation of rape. On May 24, 1918, John Calhoun was lynched in Pike on the unsupported accusation of murder. On August 12, 1918, Ike Hardin was lynched in Miller on the unsupported accusation of attempted rape. On September 3, 1918, John Gilham was lynched in Bibb on the unsupported accusation of attempted rape. On September 24, 1918, Sandy Reeves was lynched in Pierce on the unsupported accusation of scared white girl. On April 4, 1919, William Little was lynched in Unknown on the unsupported accusation of Unknown. On April 13, 1919, Willie Williams, Andrew Ruffin, and Joe Ruffin were lynched in Jenkins on the unsupported accusation of murder-slash-accomplice. 
On May 1, 1919, Benny Richards was lynched in Warren on the unsupported accusation of murder-slash-assault. On May 15, 1919, Jim Waters was lynched in Johnson on the unsupported accusation of leaving employer. On May 25, 1919, Barry Washington was lynched in Telfair on the unsupported accusation of murder. On August 2, 1919, Charles Kelly was lynched in Fayette on the unsupported accusation of argument. On August 3, 1919, an unknown man was lynched in Bleckley on the unsupported accusation of wild talk. On August 14, 1919, Jim Grant was lynched in Wilcox on the unsupported accusation of assault. On August 27, 1919, Eli Cooper was lynched in Lawrence on the unsupported accusation of organizing black farmers. On September 10, 1919, Obe Cox was lynched in Oglethorpe on the unsupported accusation of murder. On September 22, 1919, Ernest Glenwood was lynched in Dooley on the unsupported accusation of wild talk. On October 6, 1919, Jack Gordon and Will Brown were lynched in Lincoln on the unsupported accusation of murder accomplice. On October 6, 1919, Mose Martin was lynched in Lincoln on the unsupported accusation of murder. On October 7, 1919, Eugene Hamilton was lynched in Jasper on the unsupported accusation of attempted murder. On October 18, 1919, an unknown man was lynched in Marion on the unsupported accusation of intimacy with white woman. On November 2, 1919, Paul Jones was lynched in Bibb on the unsupported accusation of rape. On November 20, 1919, Wallace Baines was lynched in Morgan on the unsupported accusation of murder. On December 1, 1919, Jack Rydicer was lynched in Wilkinson on the unsupported accusation of attempted murder. On December 20, 1919, Charles West was lynched in Sumter on the unsupported accusation of murder. On June 21, 1920, Philip Gaithers was lynched in Effingham on the unsupported accusation of murder. On August 13, 1920, John Grant was lynched in Emanuel on the unsupported accusation of wage dispute. On September 22, 1920, George King was lynched in Fulton on the unsupported accusation of unknown offense. On September 24, 1920, Felix Kramer was lynched in Green on the unsupported accusation of aiding criminal. On September 26, 1920, Bob Whitehead was lynched in Sumter on the unsupported accusation of attempted murder. On November 17, 1920, Will Booney Ivory, Minnie Ivory, and Alex Bird were lynched in Coffee on the unsupported accusation of murder. On November 24, 1920, Curly McKelvey was lynched in Mitchell on the unsupported accusation of murder accomplice. On January 2, 1921, Jim Rowland was lynched in Mitchell on the unsupported accusation of attempted murder. On January 6, 1921, Sam Williams was lynched in Talbot on the unsupported accusation of unknown offense. On February 16, 1921, John Lee Aberhart was lynched in Oconee on the unsupported accusation of murder. On May 14, 1921, Rawls Ross was lynched in Coweta on the unsupported accusation of murder. On June 18, 1921, John Henry Williams was lynched in Colquitt on the unsupported accusation of murder. On December 5, 1921, Aaron Birdsong Roy Grove and Wes Hale were lynched in Oconee on the unsupported accusation of aiding criminal. 
On February 13, 1922, Will Jones was lynched in Schley on the unsupported accusation of wild talk. On February 17, 1922, John Glover was lynched in Lowndes on the unsupported accusation of murder. On March 12, 1922, Alfred Williams was lynched in Columbia on the unsupported accusation of attempted murder. On May 18, 1922, Charlie Atkins was lynched in Washington on the unsupported accusation of murder. On May 29, 1922, Will Byrd was lynched in Wayne on the unsupported accusation of murder. On June 30, 1922, Joe Jordan and James Harvey were lynched in Liberty on the unsupported accusation of debt dispute. On July 14, 1922, Sheikh Davis was lynched in Colquitt on the unsupported accusation of miscegenation. On July 24, 1922, Will Anderson was lynched in Colquitt on the unsupported accusation of attempted rape. On August 2, 1922, Cocky Glover was lynched in Monroe on the unsupported accusation of murder. On September 2, 1922, Jim Reed Long was lynched in Barrow on the unsupported accusation of attempted murder. On September 28, 1922, M. B. Burnett was lynched in Wilkes on the unsupported accusation of wild talk. On February 3, 1923, George Butts and Clinton Chamber were lynched in Hancock on the unsupported accusation of murder-slash-robbery. On August 17, 1923, Aaron Harris was lynched in Bleckley on the unsupported accusation of attempted rape. On August 17, 1923, Lee Green was lynched in Houston on the unsupported accusation of rape. On March 19, 1924, John Haynes was lynched in Crisp on the unsupported accusation of attempted rape. On April 3, 1924, Beach Thrash was lynched in Merriweather on the unsupported accusation of murder. On June 23, 1924, Marcus Westmoreland and Penny Westmoreland were lynched in Spalding on the unsupported accusation of argument. On March 2, 1925, Robert Smith was lynched in Screven on the unsupported accusation of attempted rape. On September 21, 1925, Willie Dixon was lynched in Baldwin on the unsupported accusation of murder. On July 6, 1926, Willie Wilson was lynched in Tombs on the unsupported accusation of unknown offense. On August 30, 1926, Dave Wright, White, was lynched in Coffee on the unsupported accusation of murder. On February 1, 1930, James Irwin was lynched in Irwin on the unsupported accusation of murder. On July 29, 1930, S.S. Mincy was lynched in Montgomery on the unsupported accusation of political dispute. On September 8, 1930, George Grant was lynched in McIntosh on the unsupported accusation of murder. On September 9, 1930, William Bryan was lynched in McIntosh on the unsupported accusation of unknown offense. On September 24, 1930, Willie Kirkland was lynched in Thomas on the unsupported accusation of attempted rape. On September 28, 1930, Lacey Mitchell was lynched in Thomas on the unsupported accusation of testifying against whites. On October 1, 1930, Willie Clark was lynched in Bartow on the unsupported accusation of murder. Be with us again next time when we present the next chapter of The Secret Relationship Between Blacks and Jews, Volume 3 The Leo Frank Case the lynching of a guilty man. Prepared by the Historical Research Department of the Nation of Islam, Chicago, Illinois. Copyright 2016 by Latimer Associates. All rights reserved. 
published in audiobook form by the American Mercury with permission of the Historical Research Department of the Nation of Islam. Of the Nation of Islam. Of the Nation of Islam.